good afternoon everyone uh, welcome back to our uh, part two of our uh, discussion on critical care talk, lecture series uh, approach to shock and uh, management uh, based uh, with respect to inotropes uh, so we'll be con uh, starting off the lecture with a discussion on quiz answers from six question number 16 20 and followed by that the uh, lecture uh, this lecture will soon be uploaded on our department of medicine youtube website if uh, through the lecture time, if any uh, doubts, please feel free to ask uh, directly or maybe put down the chat box or you can mail to med2 at cmcvalu.ac.in. Uh, thanks again, sir. I think we'll hand over to you, sir, for further discussion. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> we'll start off with the ABG quiz answers, questions 16 to 20. So that's question 16, patient with polytrauma, chest trauma, desaturation, myoglobinuria, renal failure. Oxygenation status, getting too much oxygen. PF ratio is reduced. Metabolic status, obviously very severely acidotic. Lactate is high, my, but the base excess is far higher than the lactate, minus 23. That is not explained by the SID, which is actually 137 minus 102, 35 is quite okay. So obviously there is some more acidifying ions due to the renal failure as a result of myoglobinuria. So that is metabolic acidosis due to multiple causes. Plus, if you notice, it's got respiratory acidosis because the CO2, although it is low, for that pH is not low enough. But we cannot apply the two digits after pH rule in this situation because the pH is less than 7.10. And uh, you cannot take 91 and say CO2 should be 90, 89 to 93 because this is too low for us to use the two digit rule. So, but we know it is not low enough as you will see in the next ABG. So, but it's definitely got a respiratory acidosis and a metabolic acidosis due to multiple causes. So this is a triple acid based disorder. 70, patient with diarrhea, hypotension, renal failure again. Here the pH is again less than 7. CO2 is much lower than the previous patient. Hyperoxia, oxygen is high again here. Normal PF ratio because the person is only on 28% oxygen. But you can't, cannot come... Uh, split it into compartments, metabolic acidosis, because no chloride or lactate is available. This was done in an old machine. And again, the, he's basically got a respiratory acidosis, but we can't apply the two-digit two digit rule here either because uh, the pH is less than 7.10. But it is lower than the previous patient, so he's compensating much better. We, so here we are not commenting on the respiratory acidosis. Previous patient, we said he definitely had respiratory acidosis. Potassium is actually 4.2 with a pH of 6.9. That means it's pretty low. Normally, the potassium will be very high with acidotic patients. Maybe because of diarrhea, he's lost potassium. He must be really hypokalemic. When you correct the acidosis, the potassium will come out. The real potassium will appear. Patient 18, lady with uh, post radiation cystitis, septic, bladder irrigation. Again, hyperoxic, reduced pH ratio. pH is okay, not too bad. Within acceptable range, almost. But if you look at the base excess is minus 17. And if you look at the sodium and the chloride, the SID, is low. So there are two components to the metabolic acidosis. Lactoacidosis acidosis as well as acidosis. If you look at the CO2, it should not be that low. I mean, it should be low. It, should, it is lower than you expect because according to the two digits rule, it should be around about 0.33 minus 5 plus 5. But this is much lower than that. So you've got a respiratory alkalosis, probably due to sepsis. So the two disorders are triple, two metabolic acidosis, one respiratory alkalosis, pulling in opposite directions, 
has made the pH sort of normalized. So if you just look at the pH, everything is fine, but actually everything is not fine. There are lots of things going on in the background. 19, gastroenteritis, hypotension, saline resuscitation in a &E, came to ICU with a pH 7.22. So the, because of metabolic problem, the CO2 seems fine, plus minus five of that, but he's got a metabolic acidosis, predominantly due to low SID, because the lactate is not worth writing much about, it's only 2.7. And the second ABG is after uh, cell I am mean, resuscitation. The chloride is slowly improving. So we have metabolic acidosis, predominantly low sit, improving over the next two days. Aspiratory compensation is appropriate. The lactate is not really a cause for the acidosis. Patient 20, the last patient in the series, asthmatic patient, exacerbation, pneumonia, hypoxemic, reduced PF ratio. But here the CO2 looks not too bad, but if you actually look at an asthmatic patient, he should be having a low CO2. I would say that CO2 is high for the pH. So though it is within a range which is acceptable, if CO2 is much higher, especially in an asthmatic, you must beware of a normal or even a high. High is bad, even a normal looking CO2 is not good for an asthmatic. It means that person may be going into respiratory muscle fatigue and exhaustion. You may have to give respiratory support and see what happens. Okay, any questions on that? Please uh, drop uh, type of, uh, questions in the chat box if any. Yeah, we can deal with that later also. So a couple of clarifications from yesterday's lecture which came to me through WhatsApp. Sure, sir. First is about the CVP. If you look at the lower values, I had said CVP 2 to 5 is okay, less than 5 is low, higher than 15 is high. I was talking about this in terms of shock. I've added on a bit of a comment there from yesterday, so you can add this to your slides. Basically, I was saying that the low CVP facilitates venous return. The high CVP retards venous return and the heart can only pump out what it receives. So if the CVP is low, it's okay if the blood pressure is fine. If you have systemic, mean systemic filling pressure is fine, it facilitates venous return. But if both are low, of course, it doesn't facilitate. But a high CVP is not necessarily good because it impedes venous return. So just to make that point clear, I was talking about normal and low values and high values in terms of a person in shock. Second bit about this arterial blood pressure, which I had said, there are a couple of methods you can use to measure arterial blood pressure, non-invasive and invasive. I'm just pointing out the fact that both correspond in many situations, but not in all situations. If there is severe vasoconstriction or significant peripheral vasodilatation, they will not correspond. In which case, you must use an intra-arterial cannula for monitoring blood pressure. So use intra-arterial cannula for accurate pressure readings if there is severe vasoconstriction or severe vasodilatory shock. That was the point of that slide. So don't trust the non-invasive blood pressure in these two situations. It may give you a wrong reading. Okay, having said that, we go on to the main part of the lecture, focusing on how do they manage a patient in shock. Now you've got diagnosis, person is coming, low blood pressure, but remember you can have shock even with a normal blood pressure. If your tissue perfusion is inadequate, and how do we manage? The classical way was to look at the diagram we had about the electrical circuit, look at the driving pressure, the mean arterial pressure and the pressure on the venous side, check the flow, calculate with systemic vascular resistance. For instance, in the example given below, MAP80, CVP10, cardiac output by liter, systemic resistance you would calculate as, 80 minus 10 by 5 for 14. They used to call it wood units, but the actual physics units is dying second per centimeter to the power of 5. And that was then sort of manipulated with high UK vessel dilators, low 
give us a constrictors. But this was done using a PA catheter, which gave a huge number of values which people could manipulate. So you could get pulmonary vascular resistance, systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output. But in the mid 90s, there was a study which showed that the use of PA catheter doesn't improve outcome. It was an observational study, but it led on to further control trials which showed the same set of observations. Using PA catheter doesn't change outcome. So the whole paradigm collapsed. There were various arguments saying people did not know how to use it. People were misinterpreting the values for the diehard intensivist population. But finally, multiple studies, the PA catheter was allowed to rest in peace. Nowadays, it is used mainly for cardiothoracic patients where it provides useful information, but not in the standard ICU patient where it's not found to be useful. So then what happened? We had this early goal-directed therapy reverse study which said early intervention using CVP and parameters such as central venous oxygen are useful and it improves outcome. But then we've seen that CVP is not really a good measure of what's happening. So what do we have left finally? We have dynamic measures. So I'll go through this in a little bit of detail so you understand what we can do. Remember that the heart is a slave. It's supposed to provide the need of the tissues. And the heart cannot suck in blood. It has to allow blood to flow in based on the systemic pressures. Now the heart may be the focus, but actually we need a change in paradigm where we look at the tissue need and see whether the heart is maintaining the need of the tissues. And this you can monitor from the central vein lactate and saturation of oxygen. I'll come to that in a moment, how we do it. So if that is good, it means the tissue needs are being met. If that is not good, basically, then it implies that the needs of the tissue have to be met. Otherwise, the tissues will switch off and die. So how do we do that? The idea in ICU is to keep the heart full, the lungs dry, kidneys full, and the brains perfuse. The brain is perfused, the kidneys are well perfused, the lungs are dry, and the heart is full. So this is a juggling we try to do in the ICU. Now, the basic questions in shock we must ask is, the first question is tissue perfusion adequate? So first look at the arterial site. Is the blood pressure and the MAP okay? The mean arterial pressure for most people is, you need is 70. But this is inadequate for a person who's got chronic vascular disease or a chronic hypertensive who's used to higher pressures. He comes post-op from a surgery. If his MAP is 70 and his urine output is dropping, the first thing is to bump up the MAP. Sometimes even up to 100 because they're used to much higher mean pressures. Second is look at the downstream parameters. Metabolic acidosis, the lactate levels, and the mixed venous or central venous oxygen saturation. If that shows an abnormality, we'll, come, we'll come, touch on the specifics in a moment. Then your next question will be, can this be reversed by using a higher cardiac output and safely? If so, can it be done first with fluid? If fluids do not do it, then we have to use inotropes. Just remember, because a person is fluid responsive does not mean you should give him fluid. You need to give him fluid if the tissues needs are not being met. Remember, the focus is on the need of the tissues, not just on whether the person is fluid responsive. If a person is fluid responsive but his lactate is normal, his venous saturation is uh, adequate, there's no point giving him fluids. And remember, fluid administration should improve perfusion and be safe to administer. Because as I said, the lungs have to be dry. If you pour water into the lungs, it's not going to improve his oxygenation. So keep those basic questions in mind. Then, looking at the heart in a little more detail, is the pump working adequately? 
Is there any obstruction like pulmonary embolism, pericardial tamponade, or tension pneumothorax? Intervene either by draining the pericardial tamponade or putting in an intercostal drain for the tension pneumothorax or thrombolizing or whatever you need to do for the pulmonary embolism. If the contractility is poor, your two important question is, is it ischemic? In which case, go in for urgent reperfusion. Or if not, we have to use inotropes. Regarding the lungs, can the lungs tolerate extra fluid? If the PF ratio is low, it's 100 or 50, you push in more fluids, only going to worsen the oxygenation. So in, if there is impaired contractility, you must make sure that the lungs are clear or if there's diastolic dysfunction, or if there's already existing wet lung, either due to a cardiac failure or a pneumonia, then you have to be very careful about fluids. So dynamic parameters are useful to distinguish between those who need and can tolerate fluids and those who need inotropes. Now let us look at the volume first. The volume relevant for resuscitation is the intravascular volume. Remember, edema does not mean the intravascular volume is adequate. Edema is extravascular, interstitial. Remember, excess fluid like excess oxygen is harmful. And if you want to calculate the extra fluid, it is cumulative fluid balance by baseline body weight into 100. And it has been shown clearly that more than 10% worsens outcome. So all fluid is not useful or Harmless. As Paracels has said, everything is poisonous. It's only the dose which permits something to be non poisonous. Now, remember, fluid is divided into several compartments. It's about 55 to 60 percent of the body weight, total body weight is fluid. In women, it's slightly less where there's more body fat. This is divided to two, intra, two large compartments intracellular, which is two thirds, and extracellular, which is one third, kept apart by the sodium potassium pump. The intra extracellular fluid is divided into interstitial and intravascular, kept apart by the serum proteins. And the intravascular is divided into the venous component, 75% in the artery, only 25%. And the venous component is further divided into the stressed volume and the unstressed volume. And remember the red cells, although they're inside the intravascular compartment, cells, the fluid inside the red cell is actually part of the intracellular fluid. Just a point to note, not that there's great significance. So fluid compartments are divided into these various groups. And depending on the fluid it administered, it divides itself into the various compartments. If you give plain glucose, it divides itself into all compartments. And finally, if you give a liter of glucose, you will get only 84 ml in the intravascular compartment. We give cell ion, you get 250. Colloids remain in the intravascular compartment. But having said that, if we give equivalent volumes, no significant difference has been found between crystalloid and colloid resuscitation. This is in clinical studies. And so you can use either for resuscitation. So fluid therapy must be clear in your mind. You give fluids in various forms in an ICU patient. Is it for resuscitation? Is it for replacement of losses? Is it for maintenance? Is it for nutrition? Or is it, is it as a carrier where you use it to give medications, electrolyte replacement? So keep in mind that all of this contributes to the fluid total balance and it's very essential for you to have a running fluid balance. Just to take an example, there are two phases in septic shock. The first phase is known as the hip phase where you have increased cardiac output, vasodilatation, Increased vascular, intravascular volume. So that is a stage of hypovolemia, relative hypovolemia. And you have a flow phase, which is the recovery phase, where the fluids start getting mobilized, the proteins start getting broken down. And the septic shock, the first hit occurs in minutes. Inflammation is predominant. The second occurs in a few hours, where you get ischemia and reperfusion injury. And some patients go on to persistent increased permeability syndrome, which lasts uh, many weeks. So your fluid therapy must be tailored to the phase of your sepsis. I'm talking only about sepsis. 
So you have to have a resuscitation phase, optimization, maintenance, and then evacuation, where you have to make sure that the fluid balance overall doesn't exceed 10% of your body weight. First 48 hours, you have to give positive balance. And thereafter, you must be very careful about giving fluids. Of course, patients get repeated episodes of sepsis. You may have to again make it positive, but overall, you must keep a track of the fluid balance. Now, the cardiac output. There are many ways to do the cardiac output. One simple way is to get a venous and an arterial carbon dioxide. And if the difference of the two is more than six, the cardiac index is low. What is the logic? Remember, in a patient with a cardiac arrest, carbon dioxide continues to accumulate while you're doing this before you start resuscitating. Once you start resuscitating, all this accumulated carbon dioxide gets washed off in the fresh blood which is coming to the tissues. So the blood returning from the previously non perfused tissue has a lot of carbon dioxide. So the venous side is flush with carbon dioxide. Now this of course is excreted easily by the lungs because the lungs are very diffusible to carbon dioxide. And on the arterial side, if the ventilation is going on, the carbon dioxide is almost normal. So the veno-arterial difference in carbon dioxide is huge with the low cardiac output. The same thing happens in low cardiac output states because the perfusion is not enough to remove all the carbon dioxide. So the venous side is stuffed with the carbon dioxide. The arterial side is normal, normal because the lungs are functioning normally and the difference becomes exaggerated. So this can be used as a simple way of looking at the cardiac output. But remember, it has to use a central line carbon dioxide, not a peripheral. Couple of words of the blood pressure. Hypotension occurs when there is failure of compensatory mechanisms. Normal blood pressure does not mean there is no shock. You must look at the lactate and the metabolic acidosis. Hypotension also impairs regional autoregulation. We are looking at the overall picture, but remember there are regional autoregulatory mechanisms for each organ that is impaired by hypotension. And normally the tissue demand is met by local autoregulation, changing the extraction, I'll talk about it in a moment, and by varying the cardiac output. And remember, measurement will not improve outcome unless you can change the parameter you are measuring. And that change has been shown to improve outcome in clinical studies. Okay, let's go on to what do we monitor? Blood pressure that is straightforward. Second is a dynamic evaluation of whether fluid is going to help. The passive leg raising test is one which is easy to do. So basically you already have a patient who is 45 degree elevated. Reverse the position for about three to four minutes. And this is about 300 ml fluid challenge because the blood in the legs will be coming into the central circulation. Look for a change in the rise in the pulse pressure or systolic blood pressure. If you've got an echo, you can look at the stroke volume. You do not look at the diastolic or the mean blood pressure. If there is a drop in SpO2, this is significant because you're telling you that it is not safe to give fluid. Your lungs are getting flooded. And the beauty of this test is it is reversible. You put the patient back, the fluid goes back. Unlike if you give 500 ml of saline, the fluid is in the body. You cannot remove it easily. The other one is stroke volume or systolic pressure variation. One needs an echo, the other you can look at the systolic pressure. This is with the mechanically ventilated patient. With the ventilation, how much is the variation in systolic pressure? Now, these are the parameters you can use. Pulse pressure variation, which I mentioned. Inferior vena cable on an ultrasound. And the percentage threshold, which tells you that the person will benefit from fluid therapy. But remember that passive leg raising has added advantage that it is an internal fluid transfer, which you can reverse easily. And remember that systolic pressure variation, you must have the patient on mechanical ventilation. And arrhythmias can reduce the sensitivity. Tidal volume must be at least 6 ml per kilogram, preferably higher, during the test. And tidal volume must not vary for, being, for it being to be accurate. So you observe it after three breaths. And then the variation helps you decide whether the person will respond to fluid or not. There was an old method known as the Bradley method, 
which gave you an approximate idea of uh, I mean, of peripheral resistance. That if it was a uh, forearm is pulsating, is very low resistance, 10 wood units. Fingers are palpable, is 10 to 15. Arm, forearm, normal is around 9 to 20. And if there's a cutoff of temperature between warm and cold skin above and below elbow, it's very high peripheral resistance. Now we come to the focus, the ultrasound, the new advent, new kid on the block in the ICU. The ultrasounds have grown shrunk in volume and weight. Now you can actually hook it to your phone with just a probe to get an evaluation of the heart. So it's important for any ICU person to try to get some amount of skill. You don't have to be as good as a radiographer. You need to know what to do, look for, and be competent at that. In fact, there are articles saying the ultrasound probe should replace the stethoscope in the ICU. Okay, so when you do the ultrasound, what here's a mnemonic which you will not forget easily, COVID. Contractility. Is the impairment of the heart global or focal? If it's focal, it's probably related to coronary artery disease. And you look at the left ventricular walls. If the left ventricular walls are meeting at end systole, it means the volume is depleted ventricle. Obstruction. Is there a pericardial tamponade? Is there tension in the thorax? Or is there a pulmonary embolism? Valve lesions. IBC size and collapsibility. And diastolic dysfunction of the heart. Thick ventricular walls and diastolic dysfunction. If you give inotropes, you can, can make the situation. We will not make the situation better. So, focus queries in the heart is, is there an effusion causing tamponade? Is the ejection adequate? Is there an embolism? Is there diastolic dysfunction? I have sent you articles and references which I will address each of this in detail. But none of them will replace your ability to do an ultrasound fast at the bedside. That can only come by practical experience. Have a look at the lungs. Again, in the articles I have sent, the wet lungs or whether there's a pneumothorax. So, you first get an idea of the cardiac output. Look at the downstream parameters. What is the lactate like? Is it high? What is the saturation in the central veins? Is it low? How does that help? Lactate, as I mentioned in the previous set of lectures, metabolized in the liver. So we can get a fake positive, false positive if the liver is affected. You can also get a false positive if there's thiamine deficiency. But if neither of them are there, an increase in lactate will reflect inadequate oxygen to the tissues. Now, what about the SCBO2? The normal extraction, as I mentioned earlier yesterday, was to use oxygen is of 25%. 1,000 ml of oxygen delivered, 250 ml extracted. So that's 25%. So if your delivery is 100, you extract 25, your return should be 75%. This is saturation. Now, if your supply reduces or your extraction increases, your return will diminish. Therefore, if you find a drop in this central way, venous oxygen saturation, you need a blood gas machine to do it, or sometimes they use inserted fiber optic probes like you use in a pulse oximeter outside. But that is not usually done in many ICUs. Much easier to get a central vein already in do a blood gas. So if you look at this curve, oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery, there's a critical point of maximum extraction below which you will find that this it is delivery dependent. It's very sensitively dependent on the delivery of oxygen. So the tissues continue to extract oxygen maximally till a certain point when it can no longer do so, then the SCVO2 starts falling and the lactate starts to rise. So at that point, you need to intervene to improve the delivery. And delivery can be improved. The hemoglobin is low, you'll have to improve the hemoglobin. The oxygen saturation arterial is low, you'll have to improve the saturation. The cardiac output is low, you'll have to improve that. So it's a dynamic monitoring. But of course, you need to know, keep in mind what exactly is the cause of the shock. If it's obstructive, I just put surgical under brackets because putting an intercostal drainage is not real surgery, nor is tapping a pericardial tamponade. 
and you may if there's a massive pulmonary embolism it may have to go for surgical removal or mechanical removal i put that first not because it's the commonest but it needs the fastest action hypovolemic obviously give fluid resuscitation cardiogenic you have to give reperfusions or inotropes vasogenic fluid or vasoactive medication that is in a nutshell now fluid resuscitation means you give a bolus if the patient is fluid responsive and if you can give it safely without the de desaturation 30 ml per kilogram or you do a passive leg raising test to make sure it's safe if blood is lost give blood and blood products but the optimum hemoglobin in the icu patient is between 7 to 9 and slightly higher in those with coronary or cerebral ischemia if you give too much blood it causes increase in viscosity and causes problems with peripheral perfusion patient situations is when you have an rv in park pericardial tamponade tension pneumothorax and bp is crashing you have to fill fast and of course you have to act fast and if there is impending respiratory failure discuss why you could get respiratory failure in shock because abnormalities in the lungs as well as respiratory muscles give oxygen and intervene fast to give ventilatory support take the pressure off the respiratory system so in a nutshell hypovolemic fluid resuscitation either crystalloid or colloid of blood as appropriate cardiogenic rv in park fluid reperfusion therapy if it is coronary ischemia inotropes if not fluid responsive vasogenic septic shock intervene within one hour that is shown to make a huge difference in outcome whatever if you delay that whatever else you do for the next 25 days will make no difference give fluids appropriate vasoactive medication obstructive as i mentioned fluid surgical intervention thrombolysis few words about inotropes administer inotropes only through a central line except dobutamine which has no vasoconstrictive action or low dose dopamine which is now discarded anyway remember acidosis reduces inotropic action so person is acidotic your first goal must be able to correct the acidosis appropriately you may need to dialyze the patient to do this but vasopressin acts even in an acidotic environment the catecholamines do not all the action is blunted remember i said you should use it through a central line but in an emergency if only a peripheral line is accessible use it piggy back through a freely flowing intravenous peripheral line for short periods of time only and remember low dose dopamine is on its way out there's no renal protective effect and has been shown to increase mortality in a couple of studies in europe called the soap studies then in nutshell alpha 1 beta 1 beta 2 and mesopressin receptors different actions with different drugs but in a nutshell sepsis use noradrenaline first and aflaxis adrenaline cardiogenic if the map is normal normal you can use dobutamine the map is low noradrenaline plus dobutamine synopsis of what i told you and i am happy to answer questions which you may have there was a question yesterday about cardiac failure and shock i'll be happy to take that or any other questions you may have yeah, as of now no thank you sir again uh, for that lecture uh, no questions as of now sir will you be able to answer that essays and question yeah what was the question yesterday i didn't get it i didn't get it fully cardiac failure <coughs> yeah i'm not having it with me the current person if there will you be able to question again put down the question again or maybe it's already been answered i don't know you will answer to next answer so i have a small question to ask so sure. regarding this uh, choice of inotropes uh, anything particular that we have any contraindications indications for pregnant ladies we recently had a patient who had was in came in shock uh, do we suggest any other to in start pregnancy with? mother in shock mother is first priority okay and that says again you don't the... rescue the mother the child is not going to survive the choice of inotropes any in specific no there is no difference you have to use it according to what the problem is the mother has yeah 
because if you don't rescue the mother the child is not going to survive sure uh there's a question sir Uh, yes, yeah, there's one question just come up now. Yeah. Uh, one question is in patient with sepsis and passes to MI, how to decide on fluid resuscitation? This is yeah. Esther's question. Yeah, good, a good question. That so basically, question. as I said, you have to have an idea as to whether the heart can take the extra fluid and whether the lungs are wet. Hmm. If they and if there is any ongoing ischemic um, process at the moment of your shock. So these three questions you need to answer very clearly in your mind. If you look at the PF ratio and it's already 100, you cannot give him fluids. If there is ongoing ischemia, organize with the cardiologist for an urgent reperfusion. So it will depend on the situation the patient is in. You have to make sure that if there is ongoing ischemia, you have to correct the ischemia. If there is lungs are wet, you can't give fluids. You have to depend on inotropes. If the cause is septic, start with noradrenaline. If the cause is cardiac and there's no septic component and the BP is manageable, start dobutamine. If the BP is low, you have to start the combination of noradrenaline and dobutamine. So there are various scenarios in which this can occur. So it depends on what are the parameters you can uh, use to decide whether the person is ischemic, whether the lungs will tolerate fluid, and whether intervention can be done for ischemia. If there's not ischemic, then it's fairly straightforward. If there's ongoing ischemia, then it becomes a little more complicated because you have to relieve the ongoing ischemia. And remember that when you talk about ischemia, you're not talking about global ischemia. Global ischemia can occur due to low blood pressure in a person with shock. Yes, sir. I was talking right. about ischemia due to coronary artery disease, which is usually focal. Yeah, I, I think that needs to be highlighted now. So then hypoperfusion causing a type 2 MI is the other thing. Which yes, is type 2 MI is a recently introduced concept where they say it is demand related. It is nothing to do with the coronary artery disease. So it's used more and more commonly now. So in which case you just treat it as, as a global perfusion problem. You just have to treat it like septic shock. That's it. There's no coronary intervention necessary. So type 2 MI is a fairly new entity which has been brought into the picture where you have to treat it as fluids or inotropes. That's it. So there's no, you cannot intervene with any coronary artery uh, balloon angioplasty or anything. You can't do any of those. So you go back to square one and decide are you going to give fluid or inotropes yes. and early antibiotics. So keep that in mind, type 2 MI means global hypoperfusion due to the state of shock to the heart. Because the demand is more and if the heart is not able to maintain its demand and it's not, there's no focal ischemic area in the heart. It is not as if one vessel is narrowed. So on that context, uh, the dosing of this um, inotropes when you go up on a dose to the maximum dose and when we start on the second dose, I mean the second so inotropes. That's a good question. Actually speaking, the doses recommended for inotropes is to titrate it to the least blood pressure adequate for maintaining perfusion. Mm -hmm. So, you, although there are recommended dosages, you can't use it as you use digoxin. You have to titrate it to the blood pressure. So, you monitor your lactate and your central venous oxygen. Mm -hmm. And as I said, mentioned in the first lecture, it's unfortunate that we have to flog the heart and the lungs when they are sick. But you have to do it for the rest of the body because the brain is the most important organ. So even though the heart is actually uh, not in a perfect form, you still have to use inotropes to keep the brain oxygenated. Otherwise, at the end of the day, if you have a hypoxic brain you and save the heart, there is uh, the, the game is lost. It's like losing the king in chess. You may have all the other pieces, but those pieces don't make you win the game. So if you have a permanent hypoxic encephalopathy, the whole of ICU stay becomes useless. So you need to be able to titrate your blood pressure to maintain cerebral perfusion and systemic perfusion to levels in which the lactate is manageable and the SCBO2 is appropriate. So that is the inotrope dose. I, you cannot have a dose and saying this is the dose to use. And I can only add on saying if the person is acidotic, please correct the acidosis so that the inotropes can work well. 
If you can't do it, start off with vasopressin because vasopressin acts even in acidemic environment. Sure. And the maximum. The idea is to get the map up to the level where your lactate production and your SCBO2 starts normalizing. And do it frequently, four to six hourly. Hmm. Uh, on that context, there are questions on there's a question which has popped up asking yeah. maximum doses of inotropes of NOR and maximum dose of adrenaline vasopressin. And when to start the before, again? you will find some patients in which you use the mid level dose and the fingers start turning blue. Hmm. That doesn't mean you can go ahead and keep increasing the dose because you have not reached the pharmacy, pharmacological maximum. Hmm. So you have to be careful in looking at a number and saying that is a maximum dose. Your maximum dose is what gets you the response. If the fingers are not blue, you keep going up on the inotropes till you reach your target. That is to normalize your lactate, I mean, get a lactate coming down and the SCVO to going up. So I, I'm not going to give you a number for the maximum dose. You start off low and titrate up. If the BP is very low, you start high and then come down. There are two ways you can approach inotrope use. One is when the person has come with a BP of 50, there's no point in starting with low dose of adrenaline. You have to start high and then as the BP improves, you come down because you, the thing you don't want to lose is time. In other patients who you can't, BP is sliding down, the map is 70, it's going down slowly. You can start at the lower dose and titrate it up. So there is no question of uh, saying being restricted by the dose in the initial stages of resuscitation. Your idea is to make sure the perfusion is appropriate without having the deleterious effects of inotropes, like a peripheral vascular gangrene and uh, arrhythmias in the heart, which all of which can be picked up clinically at the bedside. And if you find one inotrope is not working, go mm -hmm. ahead and add a second inotrope. For instance, in septic shock, noradrenaline is not working. You, you can add on your dopamine as a rescue drug. But remember, dobutamine, is a drug which does not change the mean arterial pressure. Mm. If you have a, got a patient on a good dose of dobutamine and noradrenaline, and you find the BP is not coming up, it might surprise you that if you reduce the dobutamine, the BP will suddenly come up. Because dobutamine does not change the map. It might actually decrease it slightly. So dobutamine overall is a vasodilator with a good dinotropic effect. So I would be very careful in using high-dose dobutamine in a person who is hypotensive. Mm -hmm. even in a combination with noradrenaline. So just don't go by the doses. Look for the response. It's like asking you what is the maximum dose of glucose you can give in a person who is hypoglycemic. Mm -hmm. You have to give the glucose till he wakes up or the sugars come to normal. If you've got a dionyl overdose, glybenclamide overdose, mm -hmm. you may have to give large amounts of glucose over the next 48 hours before you can normalize. There's no point going by a maximum dose at that stage. So similarly for inotropes, be sensible, look at the arrhythmias, look at the peripheral uh, perfusion, feel the fingers and use the inotropes sensibly. So the second inotrope we started uh, will be at the max dose of the first one or might be midway through? Midway. Okay. I wouldn't use it right up to, or we start getting side effects of the uh, first one. Hmm. If you start, but if you some of you start a person on dobutamine and start getting ventricular ectopics, you don't push it up to the maximum before you start an or adrenaline. Uh, two so questions. That's why I said number wise, don't go by just numbers. Go by the effects the anotropes are causing. Uh, and the question is uh, prior to this all uh, the question: How to interpret a bedside echo uh, finding of uh, poor LV systolic dysfunction in a patient with sepsis? Is a card, cause of cardiac stroke due to sepsis or a new onset ischemia? That will be about the global. Yes. Usually, you will find that in a uh, ischemia due to a coronary artery disease, type one, it will be focal hmm. dysfunction of the myocardium. A global dysfunction is usually not due to a coronary artery disease. You will call it a type two, and you treat it as type two. You cannot reperfuse a type two MI. You cannot give a either thrombolysis or do angioplasty. Hmm. You will have to treat it with inotropes or fluid depending on the uh, parameters I mentioned. The rise in cardiac enzymes won't help. No, sir. Both, no. will... both will be up. The enzymes will be up in both. It won't help. 
another question uh, role of pulse pressure variation in uh, mechanically ventilated patients with shock sorry sorry i didn't get the first part of it a role of pulse pressure variation yeah in yeah. mechanically ventilated patients with shock yes pulse pressure variation of about 12 percent in a person on mechanical ventilation of more than 6 ml per kilogram tidal volume tells you that the person is fluid depleted hmm. but as i said just because a person is fluid depleted does not mean you give him fluid you have to look at the lactate and the scbo2 and decide whether he needs fluid to improve the cardiac output to improve tissue perfusion if he's already got adequate tissue perfusion, his lactate is 1.5 and SCBO2 is 75%. Don't give him fluid because too much fluid in the long run is not good for the body. So use fluids only for, to improve tissue perfusion. Just don't use fluids because the pulse pressure variation tells you that the person's uh, volume is such that with high tidal volumes, the pulse pressure is varying. Your target is to ensure adequate tissue perfusion not to prevent a pulse pressure variation. The pulse pressure variation is only a surrogate to tell you that the person will respond to fluid. Mm -hmm. But if the PF ratio is 50, if there is pulse pressure variation, I can't give fluid mm -hmm. because I'll only worsen his oxygenation. So that is why I put the juggling problem. You have to juggle these organs. You have to keep the lungs dry to oxygenate. You have to keep the heart full. You have to keep the kidneys full and the brain perfused. So you have to, and remember the brain is the center point. Don't lose sight of that. If you juggle well, your patient comes out alive. Sometimes whatever you juggle, one of the organ gets damaged. But if the brain is the one getting damaged, the end of the game is zero. You won't win the game. And some patients don't respond to all the treatment you can give. But remember one thing, one hour for antibiotics to be in. Don't lose time with giving antibiotics in septic shock. Other forms of shock is different, but don't lose time with giving up the first dose of broad spectrum antibiotic in a septic shock. You can decide on the second dose later, but the first dose should be in, in casualty itself. So a uh, role of diuretics in a patient with a is the shock. Yeah. So the role of diuretics is only to help your fluid management. If you find that the person is fluid overloaded, poor PF ratio, lungs are wet, you need to get rid of the fluid. And there are two ways to get rid of it. One is by dialysis, which I will deal with in the last lecture. And the second is by diuretics if the kidneys are still responsive. I would personally start using a frucimide infusion not give bolus high doses because bolus high doses can cause cardiovascular instability. And once the dose is in, there's nothing much you can do about it. Mm -hmm. so start at one or two milligrams per hour infusion and you can titrate it up and see whether there's a response in the next four hours. If there's no response, you have to switch over to dialysis to remove fluid. If there's a response, go ahead and diurise to the limit in which there is cardiovascular stability. You can't make the lungs dry and the heart... Uh, empty because that would not make sure that ensure that the oxygenation reaches the tissue so it's a fine balancing act go ahead and use diuretics in the wet lungs carefully infusion wise titrating up and observing the patient if diuretics doesn't work the first six hours don't persist with it it'll only increase your carrier fluid volume and switch over to dialysis Uh, any further questions? You can also ask the next two lectures, no problems. You can, whatever questions you have. It's a shock is a difficult area because you have to juggle the needs of multiple organs and ensure that uh, they are getting what they need. And some of these organs are already damaged and therefore you have to treat them gently. So sometimes it's difficult, but at every patient you learn how to do it. That uh, unmeasurable thing called, called experience gets into our software. I think the role of ultrasound is yeah. that we have to 
and uh, to emphasize on what sir said about covid plus lungs to be assessed bedside yeah that's a mnemonic i just created because i found that appropriate anyway so uh, someone asked whether isn't it uh, the men so you mentioned fluid of choice from septic shock as normal saline isn't it plasma I didn't say fluid of choice i said you can use either you can use normal saline you can use uh, albumin you can use but don't use heta starch because it causes problems you can use any colloid you want even blood if you if the hemoglobin is low it makes no difference what fluid you use the main difference is in the cost normal saline is the cheapest in our situation yeah, but when that. you use normal saline also make sure that you keep an eye on the sin plasma light also you're asking isn't it plasma light plasma light is expensive as far as i know isn't it yeah most more, not really I'm not exactly sure of the cost but yeah cost is a problem in many of these situations so if cost is not a problem go ahead and use bring a lactate half normal saline if the sodium is high your fluid must be titrated to the uh, electrolyte uh, pattern of the of the patient but there's no difference in colloid and crystalloids except money mm -hmm. in terms of its outcome there's no difference you can use whichever you want sure thanks for the question any further questions so one other question what's the distribution of isotonic bicarbonate intra and extravascular isotonic bicarbonate is a sodium rich fluid so the sodium uh, rich fluid means the sodium potassium pump kicks in it's kept extravascular extracellular sorry cellular extracellular of course, yeah. when you administer yeah. it, it's like giving three percent saline. It goes intravascularly first, and then diffuses into the extravascular space. So it remains extracellular, but it changes the pH of the extracellular component. So the question also meant for an extracellular intravascular. No, no, I don't know. It's Sorry, asked. What is the question? Yeah, yeah. The question is asked between the distribution between intra and extravascular. I don't know. It's... Intra and extravascular, but it will be just like normal saline. Sodium bicarb will distribute itself just like normal saline because there is it has no proteins. It won't stay intravascularly. So we look at the distribution of fluid which I had given to you. For saline, the sodium bicarb will follow the same path. Mm -hmm. It will be divided between the intravascular, extravascular compartments in proportion. That is extracellular compartments. But the action will be the same as normal saline for yes, the action will be the same as normal saline, except that uh, it causes a change in pH uh, yes. in the reverse direction. Mm. Normal saline will tend to make it more acidic, bicarb will tend to make it more alkaline. One of the things we used to do in practice, but which is uh, as far as I know, not seen in any textbook, is to use in a person with a person with high SID, mm. a low sodium. High chloride, we add the bicarbonate to 5% glucose. Mm. Not keep it there, we use uh, add that solution to as a maintenance fluid so that he gets chloride free sodium. So we add 80 ml of sodium bicarbonate to 500 ml of 5% glucose. So the sodium bicarbonate usually comes at 8.4% or 7.5%. You dilute it five times. Hmm. It comes down to 1.5 around that percentage. Slightly more than normal saline, but around not as concentrated as uh, the bicarb, uh, pure bicarbonate. So use that solution and over four hours use it as a maintenance fluid. We found it works. But there's no controlled trial, so I'm not recommending it in a lecture. But uh, you see it in practice and see how it works out. Especially for patients who have got SID-induced acidosis with a low sodium and a high chloride. This is one way you can give sodium without giving chloride. And it's got sodium, so it distributes itself in the extra cellular compartment, unlike 5% extras, which will only get 64 ml in the intravascular compartment. Hmm. So it's midway between the saline. Yeah, it's some and... sort of a hybrid solution for Indian, India. Yeah. But you make sure it is very sterile when you use it. I mean, you, I mean, it should be done at the bedside and used immediately, not left standing around. 
the mixing part. Any further questions? But ultrasound skill is something you need to get if you're going to practice in the ICU. And it's best learned with somebody who already knows a bit about it and can show you. I don't know whether CMC is still running those courses, but they may be very busy. But it's good to get somebody to come and show you an ultrasound with a portable ultrasound machine. And the best probe is a probe which can see the IVC as well as the heart. No. The vascular probes uh, is too high, like 13 hertz probe and megahertz probe and all is too fine. It won't go into the, you won't be able to see enough of the heart. It's good for vascular procedures, but you need something which is say five around five. Okay. But not as low as the abdominal probe. That is very low. That we don't need that. And it's a very useful device at the bedside. I've sent you the references. Have a good read on the references. I hope everybody has received it. If you it, haven't, please send it uh, to those who haven't got it. It has been mailed to all the CMC faculties, and if anyone outside would like to have it, please please mail. Yeah, yeah to please send it to everybody. All the references. Uh, please. Uh, Ask for it to the and by mail to med2 at cmcvelo.ac.in. The rest will have been sent on that. So, so next week will be last two set of lectures series, uh, which will be on uh, neurological support and renal support in critical aid. So. No ABGs next week, but you're free to ask questions on any of the 20 ABGs. So, done. That just gives you a bird's eye view of the possible abnormalities. Thanks again, sir. I think then uh, we'll wind up for today, sir. Yeah, feedback also, if possible, before the next lecture. Please, um, yeah, update your feedbacks through via the link mentioned here, and otherwise, we we'll mail to you guys through the email. Thanks again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you, sir.